Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. We are getting ready to start our study through the Gospel of John. We just completed our study through Galatians a couple weeks back. We took a little bit more time off than what I'd originally intended, but things had come up. That's fine. So we've decided to go ahead and look at the Gospel of John. Good morning, gentlemen. Is everyone doing well today? Oh, I am. Yeah, y'all look, you look like you're doing good. I'm doing okay. Uh, by the way, <laughs> I've had a birthday since we met last. Really? It's a big one. And it was not my 75th like I announced Tuesday, Brian. I don't know if you were on Tuesday. <laughs> I, I remember, my yes. 74th birthday. Yeah, I told everybody Tuesday that I was 75 years old, but I wasn't. It's, it's a terrible thing when you don't even know how to, you know, and I didn't, and I didn't realize it until I saw my daughter yesterday. She said, how does it feel to be 74? I said, I'm 75. She said, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, my father has well, added they... about five years to his age for the last 20 years. So I don't even think about it. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, they say when you get older, your memory goes. So yeah, something well, else too. But I don't... when I turn 74, right. when I turn 74, if I look like you do, I'll be sad. <laughs> No, just kidding. <laughs> you look good for 74. Uh, yeah, well, if I had that hair now, I'd be happy. Yeah, I guess you would, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, would like to thank everyone for joining us today for our study. If this is the first time, here's how you participate in the study. On our uh, YouTube channel, we do have a chat area. Uh, if you're watching us there, feel free to drop in your thoughts, comments there. If you're watching us via or join us via the Facebook page, then of course there's the comment section to this live video. But you can also send us, oh, different thoughts through email. Um, that's the wrong button. That's the wrong button. Where's the right button? That's the wrong button. On your right. <laughs> My button's off. Anyway, send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com, and we'll try to bring those into our study. Now, before we do get into John, I know I mentioned that, we do have one question that came up just, I mean, just right after we took a break. And unfortunately, I did not, uh, we weren't able to really address it. And since John in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, I think it's a good idea to kind of bring this question in. So let me get back here to it real quick. Uh, let's see. So Glenn had asked about holiday observations. And he said, our New Testament believers instructed to celebrate certain holidays as the world does. And I thought that was a very good question. Because when you look around from a religious perspective now, the religious world celebrates several religious holidays. Now, not just the, the, the one that we think about with, with Christmas. But there's also Easter, and there's also the whatever you would call those days that lead up to it, Good Friday. Um, I don't know. There's a whole bunch of other ones and everything. Um, the first question is, does the Bible give any instructions to and how to celebrate these days? The answer is no. The Bible doesn't speak anywhere about giving us instructions to or even how, if we were, to celebrate these days. These are man-made days for all intents and purposes. Um, when you look at the Old Testament, there were many times that God in the Mosaic Law intentionally gave them days of the year to honor, to observe, in order to remember him, what he's done for them, and things of that nature. But when it, came, it comes to the New Testament, there's only one day that we are instructed specifically, and that has to do, of course, with the first day of the week. But gentlemen, if, uh, if, you know, if we're not talking about religious holidays, okay, are there any instructions that we need to keep in mind regarding a Christian who would choose to, to keep some of the holidays that maybe the current culture does put it like that kind of any thoughts? My, my thinking is that we're supposed to be Christians every day of the week, every day of the year. And, uh, behave the same way that God expects us to regardless of what day it is. If we want to set aside days to commemorate certain events or certain people, mm -hmm. general terms, then I don't, I don't see a problem with that. Even the, even the Hebrews uh, created the Feast of Purim to commemorate the, uh, the, uh, the preservation of the, yeah. of the Jews uh, from the, uh, 
intended attack of uh, Haman. And so I, I don't, I don't, I don't see a problem there. I don't think we have the right to create religious holidays. Uh, yeah. But um, I, I think uh, national holidays—that's a matter for the nation and the people in the nation to determine. So I don't yeah. see a problem with you know Independence Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Valentine's Day, Halloween. Some question Halloween based on the uh, the association with Sam Hain, but uh, it's really all, uh, all Hallows Eve. It's the night before All Saints Day. That's how it really originated, and and you know thanks to the the Catholic Church, they're the ones that come up with All Saints Day. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see a problem uh, with it. I, I don't think I'd have any uh, anybody. At, attack that on this panel yeah you I know think, uh, oh oh yeah you know i was just going to make the observation you know with a lot of those holidays another thing to consider is uh they cross the lines when i say they cross the lines too between secular and and religious i mean the ones that are supposedly religious have have a dual observation attached to them, you know, and and uh, and that's one of the things that we can give consideration to. I mean, I mean, uh, I think this past Christmas, I think because uh, Sunday was on the twenty fourth, you know, I went ahead and and preached. Uh, I typically preach a lesson, not every year, but when it approaches, you know, like either to today or tomorrow, it is. I'll, and I I did a sermon called, you know, let's put Christ back. And and uh, the the point was, you know, people say let's put Christ back in Christmas because there's a realization that there's a a national or a secular aspect that's associated with it. Uh, and of course, the lesson was let's put Christ back in our lives, let's put him back in the church, those kinds of things. Uh, 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 but that's a point to consider with holidays: is there is a secular and a religious aspect to some of those and i'm of the belief that we can observe especially the the uh, secular aspects of it uh, without without having any issues and and you know people used to make the argument well people will assume that you're making the religious observance i don't believe that any not so much now especially i mean because because there is such an emphasis on on the just the holiday aspect of it, the, the 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 traditional aspect, the family aspect of it. There's there's so much emphasis on that that I don't think everybody automatically assumes. Matter of fact, if somebody comes into my home and and uh, forgive me, but we do put up a tree, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, a a fake tree, by the way, uh, right now. And, oh, that's okay. But when, yeah, yeah. But when you look at the ornaments, when you look at the ornaments that are on my tree. When you look at the decorations around my house, you're going to see a lot of red and a lot of green, but you don't see a lot of, you don't see angels. You don't see a nativity scene. Uh, you don't see those aspects that would tie it to a religious holiday. And, and I think the fact that if somebody came into my home, which they would know that I'm a preacher, uh, and they don't see those things, maybe that gives me an opportunity to emphasize you know w what what i'm doing and how I, I to me it's just a family get together with the traditions uh a meal you know we we eat yeah. certain foods on that day et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. but there, there is the other side of that coin if you know there are some of them who believe it's wrong oh i know that you know and so um so I guess my point is, if someone believes it's wrong to celebrate it, then they themselves cannot celebrate it. You know? Right, it's, and, exactly. And you wouldn't embolden them to violate their conscience by inviting them to a Christmas party. Yeah. Right. Um, so. Yeah, you would, you would show them respect, exactly. Yeah. And incidentally, um, you know, you know, think of somebody that was converted out of Catholicism. You know, uh, uh, you know, especially early on, you know, this is this is one of those Romans 14 situations from the standpoint of 
you know, uh, you know, you get into a discussion of weak versus strong. You know, you know, who's the weak brother, and and what exactly does that mean? Well, well, as I look at the text, I almost always see the weak brother in that text as the one who's not able to do something, what it, whatever it is, and it just means that in their mind they're not convinced that it's okay to do it. And uh, and you know, a, a Catholic who all their life has been raised with not only Christmas, but, 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 you know, like, you know, like I, when you were talking a few moments ago, I think I call it the passion season, you know, um, you know, because I mean, it, it goes, uh, it goes all the way back, what, 40 days, you know, you know, 40 days mm -hmm. before um, Ash Wednesday uh, or, and all that kind of, it all goes back. So they've got a whole season that they deal with, uh, you know, as as far as that goes, and all these different things that tie into it. Um, well, let's go. Let's go ahead and, and, and move on real quick. Um, you mentioned Romans fourteen, Brian. You've got a thought on that, and then yeah, I just um, wanted, to, yeah, then we'll move on. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up really quickly. You know, the the, the statement I usually go to for the question, and we celebrate sec the holidays in the world around us. Romans 5, uh, fourteen verse five says, "One person esteems a day above another." Another yeah. esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced of his own mind. He who observes a day, observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe a day, to the Lord he does not observe it. Um, it's pretty clear that Paul is saying, you celebrate a day, a day that's special to you, that's okay. And you don't, because you don't think it's appropriate, that's okay. Now, then he'll go on to say, but don't cause each other to stumble. So the advice the scriptures give us are, number one, you're authorized. You have the, you have the privilege, the right, the liberty, to, to celebrate a holiday, you know, and uh, he's probably talking about some of the Jewish holidays of Passover. They were no longer in effect. They were no longer a religious holiday, but people probably still celebrate it. Um, like maybe, you know, if I used to be a Catholic and and I still have a Christmas, well, Catholic Christmas is a Catholic holiday, but I still celebrate it because it, you know, I like the family feel of it. That's fine, but don't cause other people to stumble. Uh, Paul would go on to say that if it, if my observing my liberty, which is a liberty to observe a holiday, causes somebody else to stumble, liberty in the Bible is something that we have to give up. Yeah, that's a good point. I got to say, there there is a very good reason to remember December 25th. It's somebody's birthday, yeah, right? Yeah, Somebody yeah. important's birthday. And, and you yeah, can't whatever. have a problem with celebrating my birthday, so... Ah, yeah, John's yeah, birthday yeah. is just yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. John, yeah, John, John's able to say, "Oh, this is all about me. This isn't has nothing yeah. to do with." It. It's yeah, the John perfect never day realized. For, perfect day for narcissistic preachers who are born on December twenty fifth. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, and and and, yeah. and 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 I believe in this little elf that yeah. goes all over the house. And, hey, and maybe I should things. have maybe I should have little bitty. Um, you know, posable dolls made of me. And it yeah, would be John on the say, shelf. I was going to say, yeah, take a picture and put your face on that elf. <laughs> you know, so. yeah. and, and incidentally, if you right. know what I'm talking about, uh, if into you the follow realm of John creepiness. on Facebook, you know that his wife, Rhonda, I don't know if she still is, but she's posted where <laughs> yeah, this thing goes in the house. So, oh, so if you Bob's know already that, ahead of me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Nicely like done, that. Bob. Nicely done. All right. So I almost had a segue speaking of John, but then Bob had to jump in with that better illustration. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we're going. We are now starting the study through our gospel through the Gospel of John. Um, we had talked about whether or not to do a dedicated introduction to it. And I really, I'd really like to get on into the study. But there are just a couple of key points to kind of keep in mind about this particular study. Um, let's go ahead and um, Bob, if you want, if you tell us just kind of real briefly, what seems to be the overall point made within the gospel, you know, if you were to be one takeaway, and then Brian, I think you had something you wanted to share as well, as far as the overview. Um, so go ahead, Bob. You're talking about the gospel of John itself? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, John is, is writing to show that Jesus is not just a man, not just a prophet, not just the king, uh, but and not just a priest, but he is God. God incarnate. I mean, the first two verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens, or not 
that exactly. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And the same, and and uh, and then in verse fourteen, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so Jesus is God, and this uh, is repeated by by Paul in uh, first first Timothy two. Uh, God manifested in the flesh. That's one aspect of the gospel. That's probably the first creed, uh, as some have said there. The Paul's statement in first, I think it's first Timothy chapter two, toward the end of the chapter. I'm not sure of the verse, but that's what he's writing. Uh, he, he refers, he, he uses several conversations, several miracles to demonstrate that Jesus is, is God. These conversations between him, for example, and and Nicodemus and him and the Jewish leaders. That's what they're all designed to do, to lead us to the conclusion, the necessary inference that God, yeah. that Jesus is God. And this is what he sums up in John 20, verses 20, uh, 30 and 31. Many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe and believing that you might have everlasting life. Okay. Good summary. Good summary. Um, and Brian, you had something that you brought up earlier in our pre-discussion that would, would be good to kind of share. Well, and it's, it's more of just a way of breaking down parts of the book of John. One thing I think is interesting is that you can kind of see that there's a lot of times where something is discussed seven times. Uh, and throughout the book of John. And that's kind of neat because we believe John is, this, you know, we understand John to be the same author as the book of Revelation, which uses seven as a lot of the theme there too. But uh, these these different types of things that are done seven times, I think a lot of people are familiar with the seven I am statements of Jesus, for example, or, or maybe you're familiar with seven miracles that Jesus will perform in the book of John. It's kind of neat because John's going to finish his book by saying the signs and wonders are given so that you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, um, that, that it's kind of important for us to see this perfection in this book and that Jesus fulfills everything that he needs to to demonstrate he's both the Messiah of the Old Testament and he is God in the flesh. And so it's kind of neat, and it's hopefully something we can bring up from time to time in our study these seven different things. And and by the way, I've, I've got them written down as a list. If any of our viewers uh, wanted, wanted me to share that list with them, just reach out to me, email me and ask for it and I'll send it to you. Um, it's just a list that we put together um, that we can kind of use as a study point uh, to help us kind of go through the book of John and seeing the different things that are listed seven times. It's just an interesting way to look at it. Well, especially considering John's the author of Revelation and the number of time now there's very specific you know seven churches and seven angels and seven spirits things of that nature but yeah it's interesting right. yeah yeah definitely because you've got like seven waters of john seven testimonies yeah, seven, of john that's right there's a, and, and and like the seven testimonies is pretty significant because the word witness and testimony are used a lot in john's writings not just here but in first john mm -hmm. and revelation john's a very legal writer you might say and seven witnesses, the seven, you know, I like to say the sevenfold testimonies are actually a pretty critical idea to proving that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It's, Jesus will say at one point, I can't just testify of myself. I need other things to testify of me. Yeah. And throughout the book of John, he'll go through these seven things, these seven, and he'll specifically state seven things. He'll specifically state, um, my time is not yet come. My hour's not come. My hour's not come. The hours not come, and then he'll say he'll say that four times, and then he'll say three times. The hours come, my hours come, you know. Uh, so, so again, there's lots of times where you grab this. There's seven feasts that are mentioned in the Book of John. Um, the three of them are the Passover, four of them are other feasts, and you know, again, there's just these little tidbits that kind of help us to to see what's going on. And that you know, if and earlier we were kind of talking about some of the things we kind of have to, I don't want to say assume. But things that we kind of have to deduce that aren't directly stated. And this is one of those. We talk about the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John being inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this. Whether this was literally a word for word or just the, the Holy Spirit guiding John's thoughts, you you can see an intention. An, um, what am I trying to say? You can see an intent. It can't be coincidence that John just happened to come up with seven testimonies to list, list or seven I am statements. 
you know, I really, my point is you really see the inspiration behind the text, you know. And I think that's an important th- statement, John, that we probably have to presume that when the writers of the life of Jesus are writing this out, that it's not meant to be understood as a, quote, word for word, because we'll see Jesus say the same thing, but he might use different words. They are condensing a conversation um, mm-hmm. throughout, uh, which is which is very reasonable. That's what all historians do. Uh, all historians take a statement and condense it to the uh, to the meaning of that statement and such. And they have the right to do it because they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. You know, it's not as though I'm not talking about the paraphrase translation of the Bible kind of thing. I'm saying that these men yeah. uh, have an instruction by the Holy Spirit to that they're condensing something Jesus has said, or they're even shifting it. They may be putting it in a different location because they're trying, like like Matthew is a very categorical gospel. He, he writes the story of Jesus in categories. One category is parables. One category is miracles. One category is teaching, doctrine. Um, and it's really important to understand that's why something Jesus says there is somewhere else. In John, one of the big questions we're going to have is in John 2 and Jesus cleansing the temple. Is that categorically or is that chronologically? Well, Luke's the only person that says his gospel is chronological. He says that in, in the yeah. first few verses Set there. Set things in order. Or. Set things in order, right. And and yeah. John, well, John doesn't necessarily make that claim. So we're not left saying we have to believe that this cleansing of the temple is, you know, out, out you know, that we're confused about. We, we can conclude, not necessarily that we do, but we can conclude cleansing of the temple in John 2 is the same cleansing that occurs at the end. Uh, it's just John is categorizing this in terms of Jesus being the Christ, the Son of God. We're we're getting this given to us. A movie maker that makes a movie with flashbacks. You know, we understand that that's a way of, of getting the idea across to us. Okay. All right. Good point. Um, Bob. Uh, you know, we are so obsessed, I think, with quoting word for word. But Jesus and the apostles didn't always do that. As a matter of fact, in his yeah. discussion with Nicodemus, as it comes up in John chapter 3, Uh, Jesus says in verse 7, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Well, if you look back at the previous verses, he didn't say that in so many words. But he did say, except a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so, uh, or except a man be born again, he uh, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so uh, the essence of that was, you must be born again. As, and the apostles do that quite often when they refer to the uh, to the prophets. They don't always quote it word for word, even when they do quote from the Hebrew Scriptures. They they uh, they give you the essence of it. And sometimes, as Paul does in Romans chapter uh, ten, even uh, he doesn't much quote it as make he changes it a little bit to reflect what he is saying about Jesus Christ. Uh, Don't ask, uh, you know, to bring Jesus back from the dead. He's already been brought back from the dead. Uh, That's not the exact wording, but that's the essence of what of what Paul says there. And he's quoting from from uh, from Moses, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, will he go up into heaven to bring down? Will he go down to earth to bring up that? That's right. And so that's not what Moses said. But that's the application that Paul is making. Yeah. yeah. The same thing is I called my son out of Egypt in Matthew chapter uh, chapter two. Or, yeah, mm-hmm. Matthew chapter. Well, Luke three, Luke chapter two. Yeah. Even called Peter, in quoting quoting Joel, did that in yeah. Acts two. The beginning of that quote and 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 from Joel chapter two twenty eight is different, a little bit different wording, and it's intentional, I believe. You know. Yeah, so Peter was inspired to say it, and Luke was inspired to write it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Tom, you had a thought. Right, yeah. Oh, by the way, that was Matthew two fifteen out of Egypt. I call my son. Thank you. So, gotcha. uh, uh, yeah, just real quick in the introduction. You know, um, one thing. You know, John uh, uh, Brian was talking about the sevens. You know, bear in mind in the Jewish culture, the number seven was associated with completion. And, you know, that's that's just an interesting observation. Yeah, and just the two things that come to my mind as I look at the Gospel of John, while all the Gospels are associated with, they're making the case for Jesus, and I believe to different audiences, 
Uh, John's is by far the most, if you, if you want to use the term, apologetic, uh, uh, and not saying I'm sorry, but 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 making the case for Jesus in in, in more of a um, um, a discourse uh, debate type of a formatting from the standpoint of, I mean, he mentions things, and then he he engages in the discussions to develop the point that this is true about Jesus and those kind of things. So, so it, it's by far the most apologetic from that standpoint. And the other thing to, to remember about the Gospel of John is um, it is about 90% of the content in the Gospel of John, if not more, is unique to the Gospel of John. You know, we, we, we talk about the fourfold Gospel and then we talk about the synoptic gospels. The synoptics are the other three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And you find a lot more parallel in Matthew, Matthew Mark, and Luke um, than you do in John. John mentions enough things that are there, but he gives some details even of those events that are not in the other gospels that give us greater appreciation of that. So, yeah. so I'm looking forward to going through the study. I know we have some people uh, in the audience that are, have, are looking forward to going through the Gospel of John. And, and so um, there you go. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and start. Brian, if you would, let's start with you reading and read the first five verses. And I'm assuming you're reading from the um, King James the King translation. James. Yeah, yeah, the King the James. James. James right? the first, verses one through five. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Okay. The, the beginning of this, Brian, um, really, uh, the points that we were making earlier, y'all made earlier about and especially what Bob was talking about, we can really, if we ask the question, why did John begin the gospel this way? Look to the end of the gospel to find out why he began this way. Um, let me think, Matthew and Luke are the only two that records about the birth of Christ and so forth. Mark jumps forward, you know, skips over that. John goes back even before that, if you would, goes back to the beginning there. Um, but what when when you look at the first five verses here and like i said bob touched on this a little bit earlier brian but in that first verse alone do you think it was john's intention to get the reader to see that jesus was god and is yeah we yeah we've mentioned that before but it um but it's just as plain a statement it is is but what's so fascinating about it is the way it's even worded is particularly catching because it's worded and it's kind of neat that Bob a second ago started quoting it and 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 went to the passage that it's meant to reflect Genesis 1 and verse 1 that that John is trying to take Jesus and say Jesus goes back to before time begins because Jesus is God and it's such a neat way to do it to 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 quote Genesis 1:1 1, 1, uh, and start John's gospel. And what does Genesis 1, 1 start off talking about? It talks about the world, but then it talks about light. And it says, you know, and God said, let there be light. And here we're talking about light. And Jesus is the light of men. So it's really neat that you have the physical creation of and the creation of light and the spiritual element of that, that is the light of the world. And it's just, um, it's just a really neat catch right away that the very first thing he drops on us just as plainly as he could, Jesus is God. You know, Jesus, you know, uh, uh, Jesus is God. And as God, you know, in particular, he is the light of the world. Um, and it's just a really neat thing to start us off with. Okay. Yeah. And, wow. and, and that's exactly what he Tom. makes the case for all throughout the book. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Bob. I just want to make it, make this point. And I know that it was implied by, by Brian, but. What John does here, he puts Jesus in Je Genesis 1. The, uh, God said, well, that was Jesus. He's the word. God said, let there be light. Well, to whom was he speaking? I'm convinced he was speaking to the Holy Spirit. 
You've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three in the creation. You've got the Father who uh, who, who came up with it. You've got the, the Son who uh, commanded it. And then you've got the Holy Spirit who actually uh, performed it. The Holy Spirit, in obeying the commands of the Word, he brought into existence that which God the Father had planned in eternity past. And so you've got all three persons, uh, the, the, the Father and the Spirit in verse 1, and then Jesus in verse 3. Uh, you've got all three persons of the Godhead in Genesis chapter 1. Okay. Um, we got a question that, that came up, and let me let, let's let's deal with Caleb's question, and then I've got a question that'll really make you think, maybe maybe not, but <laughs> Caleb's question is really more interesting. So let's see. There we go. Caleb says, "Does that mean everything we know was made through Jesus? Angels, demons, Satan? He's trying to catch us, isn't he? He's 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 he kind of the." One of those trick questions. But actually, that is a very good question. It's mean. (laughs) So, yes. (laughs) Everything that was created was created by God, and Jesus was a part of that Godhead that did that creating. And so, uh, just like it says, nothing was made uh, without him. Nothing was made that was made. All the angels were created. Now, talking about creation of Satan, was he evil when he was created? I don't believe it was God's intention to create an evil being, but he created a uh, a company of angels, all of whom had free will. And some of these angels exercised their will in opposition to God's will. And the leader of that rebellion came to be known as Satan. Now, and, I, I would say... Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. But he became he became man's adversary. God did not create an adversary for man. Go ahead, Brian. I was just going to say, I, I um, as a different view, uh, I I I, do, I typically say I don't know where Satan comes from, um, because because while while Bob's saying this, the Bible never says Satan is a fallen angel. It's not a statement in Scripture. We kind of have the Catholic Church came up with that about a thousand years ago, um, but we really don't know for sure what these statements are. I think some of it might be some people misunderstand Isaiah 14 and the prophecy of the king of Babylon. Uh, so I, I, so I sometimes uh, take a different perspective. Uh, Bob's answer is as good as any though, um, to that end, the passage I usually go to though, is Colossians chapter one and verse 16 for by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And that's probably the most uh, thorough declaration about the the concept of the creation. It's that we really get uh, that it's everything, principalities, powers. And a lot of times those terms, principalities and powers, include uh, angels and and demonic powers as well. So those are those are things that we have there, too. Now, there are only two possibilities, yeah. Satan. Either he always existed or he was created. And the only person that ever created anything or anyone yeah. was God, the Godhead. And so it is implied, and we can necessarily infer, that Satan was created by God. Well, and if, if you want a good example, if, if, if we were to look at a biblical point, you think about, let me back up, Revelation 13. All right, 12 and 13. No place found in heaven for the beast and those that followed him. All right. So it was cast out of heaven. All right. If we were to put even just a little bit of literalness to it, I realize it's, it's kind of more, more the imagery there is, is more apocalyptic and figurative, but there is a biblical answer to the question. And that goes back to Genesis chapter three. What happened before Genesis three and the devil? We don't know, but we do know that he did tempt man, you know, and then by one man, sin entered the world, et cetera there. Um, but so back to Caleb's question, yes, I guess, possibly. Colossians three sixteen really tends to answer that better for us. Yeah. So with that being said, all right, back to the text here. Um, 
there's no doubt that when you look at this, it's already been covered. This is emphasizing the deity of Jesus, the presence of Jesus in the beginning. Oh, here's my question. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Would it be a valid statement to say, in some manner of speaking, that John goes back earlier than Genesis 1-1? I think that is the case. Yeah, I do too. Genesis focuses on the physical creation of the heavens and the earth. All things physical, everything. John goes Genesis. back to the existence of God even before that point, the existence of Jesus. Yeah. yeah, the point seems to me to be in the beginning, the word already was. It, As yeah, opposed to that's right. One, in the beginning, God created the heaven yeah. there. You got God before the creation. Did, so this is in the Godhead. Yeah. D doesn't the, don't the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that God created Jesus? Yes. And the so Holy Jesus, Spirit is simply his active force? Jesus is a God and the Holy Spirit is the active force of God. Yeah. Okay. Of course, they're, they're wrong by that because uh, the book of Isaiah, and I don't know the verse, but you guys can probably know it. God says, I've not created another God and nor will I ever, or, or words to that effect. Uh, and so if, if Jesus, if God created another God, a lesser God, then he did what he said he wasn't going to do, hadn't done and wouldn't do. Okay. And so yeah. uh, Jesus is God. He was in the beginning with God and he was not was a God. And that's interesting. That's the distinction, even in the New World Translation between Gen between John 1 and Colossians uh chapter uh three mm -hmm. uh, john one says a god colossians three doesn't say a god in the new world translation interesting and the for those who don't know the new world's translation is the translation jehovah's witnesses put together pretty much to support their belief system yes yeah um caleb clarify oh, yeah. us real quick <laughs> and and conveniently, they did so. Uh, there we go. Th the writers were anonymous. Yeah, that, so, that's nice. You know, that's which nice. which means you couldn't call into question, uh, you couldn't challenge their scholarship. Yeah, uh, that, that that person has been revealed since then. Oh I yeah, don't know his name. Yeah. Uh, I think it was a one translation, a one man translation. It's like the Twitter trolls; they remain anonymous. Um, yeah. Caleb does clarify that this particular question was one that um, he had received. Um, and I think it's a good, very good question. And Caleb, he's right, that Colossians one sixteen is a good answer for that one. Yeah. Okay. I knew, well, I knew that, well, I knew Caleb didn't have the problem because he was right there with Joshua and held up Moses' hands with Joshua. <laughs> I don't know. Caleb's I, I, the son of a preacher, so don't overestimate him. I'm kidding. Yeah, I'm kidding, Caleb. Right. <laughs> All right. Now, Caleb is working with the church down in Lawton, Oklahoma. And I, I want to throw one more thought out here just to kind of uh, mm -hmm. get the idea. John, by establishing that Jesus was with God before the creation, uh, is kind of a neat catch over to what Paul says in Ephesians 3 about the eternal purpose of God, that God's eternal purpose, God's big idea that existed even before creation was the process that would bring about the church. Um, and of course, that's the body of Christ. So yeah. it's kind of neat that John is saying, you know, Jesus, who existed from the beginning, everything that he planned to do, everything that he did was an idea that existed before creation. You know, that uh, it, we're not we're not living in a time where God was trying and failing. I, I tried the creation. That didn't work. I tried the patriarchs. That didn't work. I tried the law of Moses. That didn't work. Um, even and, and the premillennialist says he tried the kingdom and it didn't work. And he says, oh, I have mm -hmm. to build the church. That's ridiculous. Yeah. The Bible says repeatedly, God's plan from the beginning was the circumstances that would bring Christ to establish the church. That was God's eternal purpose, Ephesians 3.11. Um, you know who taught me that, by the way, was Bob. Uh, years ago, I was in a debate and uh, discussing something, and Bob wrote me an email. This was like 15 years ago. I bet Bob doesn't even remember this. And he wrote me an email, and he said, you need to remind him in this debate that God's eternal purpose was the church. And he, and he got me to that passage. And I thought, yeah, that's right. And like I said, I bet Bob doesn't even remember. But uh, years ago, Bob gave me that, and it was a, it was a real. 
Well, I appreciate that's not that. a comment about Bob's age when you said Bob probably doesn't remember it. So that's not uh, a comment about his age. Yeah, I was I was only sixty years old at that time, or fifty <laughs> or sixty one. <laughs> Well, another quick question, and I'm going to throw this one to Tom. Verses 4 and 5, you know, we've been talking about John's approach in writing this, different from Genesis 1. Um, we know Genesis and Genesis 1, um, God, you know, let there be light, and there was light, etc. And here he says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Tom, you got any thoughts on those, on that statement there by John? Well, you know, again, I, I think it's interesting, the point that Brian made, uh, that Brian made about Genesis 1, you know, God said, let there be light, and here you find him described both as life and light, and by the way, both of those developed in Genesis 1 pretty quickly. Um, I One observation I make about this is uh, John is still dealing with um, his introduction. Uh, you know, I, I mean, you you've got Jesus has been introduced. Now you've got what Jesus came to this earth to do is introduced. You know, uh, the, I, I think the life that he's talking about here, yes, yes, he created life, you know, uh, uh, as recorded in Genesis chapter one. But obviously, John is going to immediately or pretty quickly lead this to a spiritual um, a spiritual application and spiritual life is ultimately, and that's ultimately the discussion. You know, I I, yeah. I was looking at a verse in our Bible class last night, uh, and and I mentioned a word being a double entendre, and, and and that that's an interesting expression. And basically, what it means is a, it, it it's a word that has two different meanings. One meaning is obvious or clear, but the other one is implied. And what we were dealing with was the word wait uh, in Ezra chapter 8, where where uh, priests were weighed the uh, a gift that was to be carried from Babylon to Jerusalem, and they weighed it out, and the weight was given. And the primary meaning is how heavy those objects were. The secondary meaning is what about the weight where the priests were concerned? You know, uh, the weight upon them to be responsible. Well, you know, you've got this, in, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus was there as life was created on earth. Physical, physical life. But ultimately... It's about spiritual life, which is the, the second thing that has led to. And so you've got that idea. Jesus, he creates life, and it is that life that brings the light that we need. And several times Jesus is going to emphasize himself in John as the light of the world. And in verse number five, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. John is clearly in that statement talking about spiritual light and spiritual darkness. The fact that uh, here is the life and the light that came to give you hope and many in the world rejected it. And so that's kind of my summary of what I see in those verses. If that and makes sense. That the light was imperceptible to them. That's, exactly. how, that's how blind they were. Yeah. Uh, but, and by the way, it was voluntarily imperceptible. It wasn't that it could not be comprehended, but they chose not to comprehend it. And before we get too far away from what mm -hmm. Brian said, I want to comment on something. Well, both Brian and John made this point about uh, God did not try and fail, try and fail, try and fail, try and fail. Several, three words are repeated in Genesis. It was so. Every time God moved to do a thing, it was so. Uh, there was never any failing. With, there was never any trying with God. Uh, God is the only person of whom it could truly be said, he does not try, he does. <laughs> and so uh, he does what he intends to do. He doesn't try to do it. Yeah. And so, That's a good point. If he, so he, he never failed. All right. Good point. Good point. 
Um, two more thoughts real quick. We are about 11.53. I know we started kind of late, so we'll try not as far as with the actual study study. So we try, won't try to hold you this late, but two thoughts real quick and, and, and question for you guys. It's interesting that he says, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. You think about in the beginning, Genesis chapter one, God said, let there be light, implying that there was only darkness in the, in the physical creation process. Um, he brought forth light and the, and he separated the light from darkness and he called the light day. Of course, and he called the darkness night. It's an interesting statement or a similarity between those two statements there. One very physical in its description two very spiritual in its description, as you've already talked about. The other thing is, do we want to talk about the word word in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. Yes. Let's talk, talk about that because that's really neat. Yeah, um, yeah. but John, before uh, uh, oh. Brian, before you do that, just a real quick observation on light, since we're dealing with light. In, in verse number five, the light shines in the darkness. It's kind of interesting the way that's written. That word shines is present tense. So as John is introducing Jesus, he's basically saying he still shines. You know, even as John is writing this, even though Jesus had gone back to heaven. So, uh, so that's, that's your spiritual application here. Okay, back to you, Brian. I'm sorry, I get really excited about this. Uh, let's talk about the word "word." So, let's, I'm going to talk. I'm going to start this by telling a story. Uh, decades before the Book of John is written, there is an old Jewish philosopher named Philo, and he's writing about the Old Testament. So Philo's kind of goofy sometimes, but sometimes he really lands it. And he's saying, you know, how is it that in the Old Testament, God could talk to people, you know, like he would talk to Abraham or he talked to Jacob. And he'd say, you know, what I think it must be is that God had another self, another identity that he could talk to these people, that he could sit down and he could talk to these people. In fact, he makes a play of the word of the God of Bethel. Bethel means house of God, but it also could mean place of God. And he says, it's God in the place of God, you know, that there's a God, God could be in some way two people at once. Um, and he's reasoning all this stuff out. And like I said, he doesn't, this is before the New Testament. This is, this is at the very, very, very end of the Old Testament. And he says, if I had to come up with a name for this God in the place of God, he must be the mind of God. So I will call him the Logos of God. And logos, uh, meaning mind, meaning, uh, it, it, here's what's really cool about this word logos. Logos means a lot of things. I, I read a math book once where they said that logos, it was also used by Greek mathematicians to describe a ratio, a comparison of things to each other. Hmm. Logos is the word word. You know, in the beginning, God, it was the word logos. We get from it the word logic, uh, logistic. You know, there, there's there's such an incredible weight to this word that gets used to describe Jesus. And it's the idea that Jesus is the living, incarnate personality, mind, and will, and speech of God uh, put onto the earth. One of the things that, uh, that Bob mentioned early on, he said, Jesus is a prophet, a priest, and a king. And, you know, Matthew kind of talks about Jesus as the king. We might say that this is Jesus as the great prophet of God because Jesus is the actual embodied word of God. Prophets brought the word of God. Jesus is the word of God, which means he's that much more than any prophet who ever lived because the other prophets had to receive God's word. Jesus is God's word. Jesus doesn't have to ask God when he does miracles like, you know, calming the, the weather or, uh, you know, doing things. He doesn't have to say, God, bring this about like Elijah did. He can say it because he is God and he's the very mind of God. And so, um, you know, John, I, don't, I assume this is probably where you want to go with this because it is really neat. The, the word that is used here to describe Jesus because it's so heavy and it's full of so many things to think about later paul talks about having the mind of christ or christ is the mind of god wow this is this is what john is talking about excellent point you know, and much better said stated than i could have said it <laughs> go ahead bob yeah verse 18 no one has seen god at any time 
the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So he's the declaration of God. And uh, and so that that goes uh, alongside goes hand in hand with what Brian was saying. He's the uh, the the living declaration yeah. of God. When you when they looked at Jesus, they were looking at God, not that his body was God, but that his character, his personality was God. The works that he did were the works of God, and so they were seeing God in action when they when they saw Jesus. They were hearing the word of God, the spoken word of God, when the word, the living word of God spoke. And so, yeah, it all goes hand in hand, uh, hand in hand there. Yeah. This is one of those times that we always have, we always have to remember that we are children trying to comprehend something that in and of itself is beyond our ability to truly comprehend as it is. And he, our Heavenly Father, is explaining it to us in a way that we can understand, you know, um, without having the fullest of understandings that we one day will have. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of John's statement. Um, we don't know what Jesus is like, but we know that we will be like him one day. Yeah. And that's an inspired apostle making that statement there. Um, and uh, yeah, here's a comment the from, same one who wrote this gospel. Yeah, that's right. Uh, coming in a comment from Boyce. He says, almost like he's, quote, God with us. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Emmanuel. Good point. Emmanuel, that's right. Appreciate that. All right. Let's see. That's probably a good stopping point. Um, next week, John will introduce John, not himself, but John the baptizer. And we'll bring in his role. And, and it's interesting when you stop and look at the God that, you know, Matthew, Luke, and even, even Mark's comments about John and his work here, when we get into the role of John next week, just kind of as a precursor, kind of precursory look at it. He says, there was a man sent from God. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. But he will go on to say that John was not that light but was to send, but was to bear witness of that light. And so John brings the baptizer, John, the baptizer into the discussion now showing his role as a witness of the light. And we'll look at that, of course, next week. Um, any, any other final thoughts or comments on the first five verses of John? Any thoughts? Okay. Well, let me take a moment to remind everyone. You can, because we had some people who were late. Jared Dart said he was very late. <laughs> if you've missed the study, you can go back and watch it later. Um, it'll be uh, available on our YouTube channel as well as our Facebook page. Both of those are at Truth Factor Live. And um, you can go back and look at it later. Once I get the website updated some point either today or tomorrow, it will be on the front page of the website and you can watch it there as well. On a side note, I am in the process of trying to uh, get the, the website completely redone. The content management system that I used uh, was last supported in 2015, I think. So I'm switching over to one called Concrete, and so I'm in the process of rebuilding the website on there. But anyway, you can go to truthfactor.com and um, have access to the study and see what's coming up next week once we once I get it updated. But if you'd like to email us, if you'd like to contact us, you can send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com. Now, if you really want to talk to us personally, you'll see individual email addresses for each one of our regular participants here on Truth Factor and um, contact them. Just use the short version of their first name. I say that because of Tom um, at Truth Factor dot com and they will receive those emails um that you send to them all righty i guess that's it any final thoughts enjoyed it i appreciate appreciate all your thoughts you you guys are pretty smart i appreciate that um this it's is one fun. of the reasons why <laughs> it's one of the reasons why i've always enjoyed doing this okay because we get to study together i get to study with you guys and, you know, when I study alone, I've just got the thoughts that go on here, 
maybe a commentary or so forth. But when you get to talk with other people, study with other people, even the folks in, at home, you, yourself, um, the thoughts that you have are very beneficial in helping to expand our understanding, expand our proper understanding of the biblical text. And I really appreciate you guys who are here on camera and you who are at home uh, joining us, participating, if you want to, via chat room, just your sheer presence is very edifying to us and very, very important. So, all righty. Well, let's continue our study of the Gospel of John. We'll pick up chapter 1, verse 6, Lord willing, next Thursday. I think that is right at the 1st of February, February 1st. And we'll continue at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time right here at truthfactor.com or Truth Factor Live on our social medias. Thank you so much, and we'll see everyone next week. Bye-bye.